Just ahead, there's another edition of the Florida Roundtable, a service of Florida's talk and entertainment networks and in the Orlando area on Tough TV 38. I'm Reagan Smith, Public Affairs Director of the Florida News Network. I'm Al Spryan. Reagan, we have a gentleman, Toby Harnden. He interviewed Chris Kyle, American Sniper, and wrote a great book about the war in Afghanistan. Dead Men Risen is the book, an epic story of war and heroism in Afghanistan, as Al said. Uh, Toby is the Washington Bureau Chief of the Sunday Times of London. He spent a long time in Afghanistan and Iraq and has a marvelous written record here. Stay put. The Florida Roundtable begins following these messages. This is the Florida Roundtable, a service of Florida's talk and entertainment networks. I'm Reagan Smith, Public Affairs Director of the Florida News Network. And I'm political commentator Al Spry. It's great to be here, as always, with you, Reagan, on Florida Roundtable with uh, 80 stations across the state. Um, We have a wonderful uh, group of listeners who enjoy this show every weekend. Hello to all of you. Hello to our fans on Tough TV 38. Yep. Uh, We enjoy being on uh, TV where you could see... Reagan's pretty face, and then you can see my <laughs> ugly mug. That, but <laughs> uh, but uh, I want to start things uh, off with uh, the Hillary email mm, uh, okay. debacle. Yes. I would, it, I, would, I would call it that. So, you know, the Clintons are never too far away from a scandal, it seems. And we had gone quite a few years without one. And I think that it was time to kind of get it, get one. You think that's a, that's a, it, yep. the American public needs it every it, so often. It, it's in so. the great tradition of Hillary. Now yes. Think back. In, in Bill's first term, we're going to have this major health care reform, the biggest health care reform since Harry Truman. That's what they're telling us. It took Barack Obama to get it through, right? Right. He put her in charge of it. She wasn't elected to anything. She was only his wife, the first lady. And what did she do? Cloaked herself in secrecy. Nobody saw the emails. Nobody saw the communications. And what? To, and when they finally unveiled it, after without consulting with anybody else, it sank their ship. And the Republicans took control of Congress for the first time in forty years, and, based on criticism of her handling of health care. And now the Democrats want her to run for president, mm. and she's the leading candidate, and yeah. she hasn't even declared yet. What, what, what's what? His, just history just repeats itself. Is that what it is, right now? People forget, yeah. you know. They, we don't forget, they, though, do we? No, no. Mind no. like an elephant. <laughs> uh, so let's talk about this. There's a, a piece by Dan Metcalf uh, that was in Politico. Uh, Hillary's email defense is laughable, it's called. I should know. I ran FOIA, which is Freedom of Information Act, for the U.S. government. Mm. I thought when I retired from the Justice Department in 07, I was done with records-related scandals. Uh, but... It turns out I was wrong. We now have former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton being revealed as someone who took the unprecedented step of arranging to use her personal email account for all of her official email communications. Also, she decided to use her own email server equipment rather than a commercial Internet service provider, so all the records would reside solely within her personal control at home. And if that were not enough, she proceeded blithely, though not uncharacteristically, of course, to present herself to the public at a press conference uh, back on March 10th, as if there was really nothing wrong with any of this. Well, there is. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) She basically um... said, well, I didn't want to have to use two separate phones to get email in each phone, so I wanted to, you know to do it this way and meanwhile well, i have a phone be... <laughs> i have a phone you could put 10 different emails i was going to say that's really hard isn't it Al, huh? servers yeah, on yeah, and it and it takes really a couple agree. you know within a minute yeah uh, so uh, it was a silly excuse she obviously wanted to control the information she was putting out there and uh, it, this just speaks volumes about what we could look forward to uh, well, if there was a Clinton presidency, her her approval rating has dropped five points uh, in the in the wake of this, and it's actually dropped ten points uh, over the period of the last year. So as more attention is being paid to her, uh, some eyes should open. I hope. But here's the good. No, it won't happen. Here's the here's why. <laughs> right. uh, the Rick Scott factor. Mm. All the stuff that came out about Rick, and he still won another term. Now we've had the governor on a few times. Nothing personally against the governor. He's a guy who obviously, you know, we, everybody has some skeletons. But 
we talk about secrecy with Clinton. I can't leave Rick out because here's a piece by Lucy Morgan. She gives Rick Scott an F for openness and an A for secrecy. Some governors are slow learners, she said. Rick Scott is beyond slow. He doesn't seem to care about access to meetings and information usually available to Floridians. We have what we call the sunshine law here, which makes it a lot of things public. Yeah. Well, we'll tell you more <laughs> in a little bit about yeah. this piece. We're going to pause along our network line. Uh, we'll be joined momentarily by the Washington Bureau Chief of the Sunday Times of London, Toby Harnden. We're going to talk about his brand new book, Dead Men Risen, an epic story of war and heroism in Afghanistan. But let us remind you that you're listening to the Florida Roundtable, the service of Florida's talk and entertainment networks, and in the Orlando area on Tough TV 38. I'm Reagan Smith. I'm Al Spry. And we'll be joined by Toby Harnden when the conversation continues following these messages. We are back. You're listening to the Florida Roundtable, a service of Florida's talk and entertainment networks and in the Orlando area on Tough TV 38. I'm Reagan Smith. And I'm Al Spry. And at this point of the show, Al, as promised, we are off to the Washington, D.C. area where we are joined by Toby Harnden, author, historian, veteran foreign correspondent. Uh, Toby has reported from all over the world Uh, He has covered the American and British troops in Iraq, Afghanistan, Northern Ireland uh, over the past 15 years. He is the Washington Bureau Chief for the Sunday Times of London, uh, holds a dual British and American citizenship. He was a uh, a presenter and reporter in July of uh, 2013, the BBC Panorama special, Broken by Battle. Well, he and his family live in Virginia. And Toby, welcome to the Florida Roundtable. Hi, great to be with you. Have I have I left anything out there? Uh, can you? you well, wanted, that all you... sounded quite impressive. <laughs> I like, I'd quite like to meet that guy. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I think we might be able to arrange an interview with yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, first of all, I want to I want to ask you, how's it going with uh, the legal pot situation in D.C.? I know it's a little off the beat, but I, I just was curious if you've seen any changes or anything happening up there in D.C. Um, no, I haven't. I mean, you know, I, I sort of listen to the local news and read the local news, but um, being a sort of family man in northern Virginia, where as far, as far as I'm aware, you can't smoke pot, I certainly haven't seen any changes. And, um, and maybe in my younger days, I might have been hanging out in the places in D.C. where this stuff might have been going on. <laughs> Um, but um, I'm not at the moment, I'm afraid. Over in Georgetown or something, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, the occasion of our visit today, uh, Toby has a brand new book from Regnery History, the, our, our, our publishing friends. Uh, Dead Men Risen, an epic story of war and heroism and Afghanistan. So, uh, f- for starters, I, I guess uh, the first question ought to be, uh, you, you spent the time in Afghanistan. What motivated you? What made you decide that this particular book was necessary? Well, it was a very personal thing. Um, I was in, um, in, here in the U.S. Um, on July the 1st, um, 2009. I was actually doing a trip, driving down, the, tracing the the length of the Mississippi, and I was in Dubuque, Iowa, and I switched on my computer, and I just saw this headline, um, Lieutenant Colonel Rupert Thornlow killed in Afghanistan. And um, Rupert Thornlow was a friend of mine. Um, I'd known him from Northern Ireland days when um, when I was a, the island correspondent for the Telegraph newspaper, and he was an, um, a young captain, Army intelligence officer. And, um, you know, he'd been sort of a contact and then, and then a friend. And um, he'd risen to command his regiment. He was, the, he was the commanding officer of the Welsh Guards, battalion commander out there. And I knew that they'd been facing, you know, a, a terrible time. They'd already lost a platoon commander, and they'd lost one of his company commanders, uh, amongst others. Um, but uh, Rupert was killed by an IED, and he was the first uh, commanding officer of the battalion to be killed in action since the Falklands War uh, for, for the Brits. And... Um, and it was the first time since the Korean War that a single battalion had lost a commanding officer, a company commander, and a platoon commander. So that was the trigger, really. I was just, you know, I mean, I was, I was, you know, devastated by the loss of a friend and, and just felt terrible for his, for his parents and, and, and his, his wife and his daughters. Um, and, you know, I was sort of reaching out to various members of the Welsh Guards who I'd got to know over the years and, and um, and it became clear to me that there was a story um, to be told about what was going on out there. 
so I just decided I needed to get out there. And um, a few weeks later, I was I was out there um, on the ground in Helmand with the Welsh Guards, and and I mean I was alongside Charlie Anselm, who was who I'd also known from Iraq. And he was, um, and he was Rupert's replacement, sort of battle casualty replacement, and I was out there on the ground with them. Yeah, it looks here. I'm looking at some of the pictures in the book. There's Rupert there with his, uh, looks like his two daughters, and uh, that's, a, right, that's yeah. a shame. Sorry about uh, losing your friend there. Uh, tell us about when you when you first went over there. I mean, what was the experience like? Uh, you had to get settled in, I imagine, and then uh, did you start going out on different uh, tours and, and so forth? Yeah, I mean, there wasn't much. I mean, I sort of hit the ground running, really. I mean, I'd been out to Helmand before. In fact, I'd been out there just before British troops arrived, and that was kind of a really hairy trip when I was sort of dressed in sort of local costume. If you, I'm sure I wasn't kidding anybody, but, you know, lying on back seats of cars, driving around. So I was aware of the sort of lay of the land in, in Helmand. Um, but, you know, I was um, like any other American or Brit um, you know, I'm just reading newspaper headlines and thinking, "Wow, it seems it seems really bad out there." And um, and but what I hadn't appre- appreciated really was the, the sort of sheer terror of the of, of the young soldiers, the British soldiers of that time, because the Taliban had perfected um, what was known as low metal content IEDs, improvised explosive devices. Um, but the British didn't have the right equipment; they only had metal detectors to look for these devices. So you had young soldiers walking along these tracks, and I was walking along behind them, um, looking for these IEDs with a metal detector, knowing that there may well be no metal in them at all. And um, so, you know, that was possibly one of the reasons why Rupert Thornley was killed. He was killed by an ID that, that, that blew up a vehicle, and that road had been cleared before by metal detectors. So, I mean, it was just the sheer, the sheer terror, sort of freezing panic sometimes of these young soldiers. That was the thing that really struck me most of all. And then, you know, more broadly, just a lack of equipment, uh, a lack of, um, of proper armoured vehicles, leaving the soldiers terribly exposed, and not enough troops to, to um, achieve the mission that they've been given out there. Why do you think that was? Why do you think that they were under-equipped and undermanned? Well, that's a really good question. I mean, certainly politicians bear, bear part of the blame. But Those damn politicians! I think, <laughs> <laughs> I think there was just this desire... From 2006, um, when you know the British had not performed particularly impressively in Iraq, you know they mm-hmm. bailed out by the Americans in, in, in Basra, um, and they thought, well, I mean, let's do, you know, let's let's show what we can do. Let's let's um, let's go to Helmand. Let's um, you know, let's um, stop the drug trade there. Stop heroin getting onto our streets. Let's prove, you know, show the Americans that, that we can do something. And I think for the army, you know, this careers are made on this kind of thing. You know, it was an opportunity for the army to show what it could do, you know, in fighting against sort of the Navy and the Royal Air Force in defense cuts. I mean, it's a very parochial type reasons. And so they just went in there with a sort of optimistic scenario. I mean, one defense secretary in Britain said that, that, that he hoped that no bullets would be fired. I mean, millions and millions and millions of bullets have been fired since he said that. So I think it was just sort of rose-tinted spectacles, and uh, they didn't realize um, what a fight the Taliban was going to be up, up for. And, you know, and the result of this was, you know, in the summer that I, I was there in 2009, you had 10,000 British troops and then 20,000 U.S. Marines came in. Tell me, uh, one of the things that drew me to this, one of the things you did in, in piecing this together, you conducted more than 300 interviews uh, with these fellows. And I, I, I want you to talk about that. How difficult was that? Were they willing to open up? Did you have to pry? How did you gain their, the confidence uh, in, in, in getting these folks to talk to you? Yeah, well, sometimes it's not easy. And, I mean, I like it when, when I got out there, it's a bit like a couple of times I moved from one end of the country to the other in Britain when I was a kid, and I'd walk onto the playground and I wouldn't know a single person, and I think, oh, you know, it's going to be a difficult few days, but, I'm gonna, you know, that guy looks like he could be a friend. You know, maybe if I play this game, you know, that'll help me, and I know that in a week's time it'll, it'll be fine. And it's a little bit like that going on an embed. You don't know anybody. People are looking at you with a bit of suspicion. Who is this guy? But you soon break down the barriers. I mean, I served in the Royal Navy, so I, I think I understand servicemen and servicewomen and, and what the sort of mentality is. I, I know the rank structure. I appreciate that, um, you know, all an important role that s- sergeants have and their relationship with young officers. So I think I get all that. And I think also, 
um, you know, troops, they give you, they give you um, points for being out there, really, that you have some credibility because you're prepared to, sort of, I guess, risk your life by being out there alongside them. And also, a lot of these young guys, when you're actually out there, you know, they're conscious, you, you know, you might be the last person they speak to. And I think they're conscious sometimes of their sort of place in history, and they, they want to say what they're going through. And also, sometimes as an outsider, um, because you're not in the rank structure, it's almost a little bit like if, if, if you're the chaplain or, 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 a, or a doctor, but even more so because you're, you're, you're not in the, in the military at all. Sometimes people confide in you because, you know, they're not going to lose face or they're not going to be uh, criticized for it. So I think there's a little bit of that. And then also just over time, I just got to know these guys. I mean, I spoke to them out there. I traveled all around their bases. You know, I just interviewed as many people as I could. And then I went to see them back on their base in Aldershot when they got back. And I kept in touch with them. I went to their homes in Wales. You know, I'd, I would speak to them on the phone and email. And you know, so, I, so I nurtured those relationships over a, a year, a year and a half, and just soaked up everything I could. And I did find that some people um, were pretty reticent at first and almost, you know, I felt suspicious of me or, you know, just sort of not, not cooperative. But eventually some of those were the people opened up most and it took and it took many many months and so i found that once i built that foundation and later on people would people were just telling me some stuff that they never would have told me in the first week or two that gave you some personal cachet with these folks the fact that you were a veteran yourself and, and that you were out there uh, and but i think you put your finger on it too uh, i suspected that it was difficult and took a long time for them to begin to open up with you and, and talk about the problems and uh, the, the, the uh, business of being under-equipped and whatnot. Did that catch you off guard? Was there some surprise there? I was surprised. I was surprised. And certainly there was one publisher that was interested in publishing the book, or me writing the book and then publishing it very, very quickly. And if I'd done that, it would have been a very, very different book, and I'm glad I didn't. It would have because it wouldn't have had the perspective of a bit of of a bit of time. And so, you know, when you're out there, troops, quite understandably, almost as a survival mechanism, they believe in what they're doing. They think it's working. They think they're making a difference, and um, and they and they're you know very positive. I mean, that's that's the type of people the troops are. They're positive, can-do people who who look at the possibilities rather than the, the, the negatives. And um, so, if you, so in the very short term, you get a slightly um, skewed perspective. You know, it looks much rosier than, than it really is. But over, over time, he, you know, these troops themselves, once they come back, once they've seen what was continuing to happen, they were able to reflect, um, you, know, was it all, you know, was it all worth it? Were, were we doing the right thing? Did we make a difference in that village? What did it really matter ultimately? So, yes, it did take me off guard. And, um, and inc- increasingly, as, as time went on, I found out more and more about you know, Rupert Thornlow's um, concerns about manpower and equipment, for instance. I, I, I didn't get them for, for, for many months until somebody gave me a, a number of documents and emails that, that, that he'd sent. Toby, so, uh, we're going gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna to have to, uh, we do have to take a little bit of a pause along the network line here. We'll let you tie up that thought in just a moment. But we want to remind the folks that they are listening to the Florida Roundtable, a service of Florida's talk and entertainment networks, and in the Orlando area of Tough TV 38. I'm Reagan Smith. I'm Al Spry. Our very special guest this day is Toby Harnden. His book, Dead Men Risen, an epic story of war and heroism in Afghanistan from our friends at Regnery History. We'll continue the conversation in a moment. From Pensacola to Key West and all points in between, you're listening to the Florida Roundtable, a service of Florida's talk and entertainment networks, and in the Orlando area on Tough TV 38. I'm Reagan Smith. And I'm Al Spry. Our very special guest this day is Toby Herndon, the author of Dead Men Risen, an epic story of war and heroism in Afghanistan. It is from our friends at Regnery Publishing. Uh, Toby is the uh, Washington Bureau Chief for the Sunday Times of London. This is an award-winning book, the Orwell Book Prize. Uh, and, and Toby, um, we were talking about uh, you being taken a little bit by surprise uh, as that last segment ended there uh, with the equipment problems and some of the things that uh, you discovered while you were in Afghanistan interviewing all of these troops. And I wanted to give you a chance to kind of just tie up that thought and we'll go on from there. 
yeah, sure. For me, it was just a sort of a lesson that, um, you know, you'll only learn so much from newspaper reports and, and media and obviously what, what governments say and that the reality on the ground is, is, is very different. So that's something I've tried to sort of stick by all my career and, um, and certainly, certainly in this case, um, all, all was not quite what it seemed from the outside once, once I got there into, into Helmand. Now, you had the opportunity to interview Chris Kyle, of course, the uh, focus of the uh, very, very, very popular and, 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 and profitable movie, American Sniper. Uh, he, uh, 160 confirmed kills in Iraq. Uh, was that an in, a face-to-face interview you did with him? No, it was, unfortunately, I never met him. Um, it, was, it was a phone interview. Um, t- but, t- uh, yeah, I wish I'd, I wish I'd actually had the chance to meet him. Tell us about that, your experience there with, uh, with interviewing Chris. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, it was, um, as I recall, I think it was in um, about April, April, May two, 2012. And um, <laughs> the occasion, interestingly, was, um, I, was the, I was the first person to sort of break the story that... Um, a number of, uh, of serving and retired SEALs were, were very unhappy about the way President Obama himself and the Obama administration in general were sort of taking credit for killing um, bin Laden. And um, so Chris Kyle was one of the, the SEALs I, I spoke to about that. Um, and, you know, he, he, did, he thought it was unseemly. He, 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 you know, he believed that, um, you know, it was the men on the ground that did it and that any commander-in-chief would have, would have taken that decision. But we also just talked more broadly um, about snipers. I mean, I'm, I've always been fascinated by snipers. I mean, uh, my first book, Bandit Country, set in Northern Ireland, um, had a lot about snipers. Um, in, that, in that instance, mainly enemy snipers and IRA snipers, but, but there were, you know, counter snipers um, sort of working against them. Um, but in Hellman's, um, there were a, two, two phenomenal uh, British snipers who um, they killed 75 Taliban in, in 40 days, so an incredible toll not quite as high as Chris Kyle's toll. So we, t- we talked about the mentality of the, um, of the sniper and Chris's, you know, very firm belief, which comes through very strongly um, in the film, which I thought was magnificent, that it's not about taking lives, it's about saving lives. And that he believed, I think, with, you know, some considerable justification that every shot he took saved the lives of ordinary Iraqi civilians and also his, um, his fellow servicemen. The uh, you you touched upon uh, President Obama and some resentment on, on on the troops part of his taking credit for the kill of Bin Laden. Uh, I want to go back and and let's talk about him for a minute. Uh, this troop withdrawal plan. Uh, you have some reaction to it, uh, uh, rather pointed. T- tell us about this. What is the president doing? Yeah. Well, you know, there are no easy answers in 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 any of this, and I guess. You know, you could say there are no easy answers once a decision gets to the Oval Office. But, um, I mean, I, I fear that we've sort of seen this movie before. Um, we've currently got no um, American or British troops in Helmand province. And as I just sort of, you know, was mentioning earlier, we have 30,000 troops in, in, in 2009. Um, we've had, we, there was um, a drone strike the other day on an ISIS leader um, who was in, in Helmand with six, with six comrades. Now, it's great that we got him. But that shows that ISIS is stepping into the vacuum that we've left by leaving there. The current plan is to have um, about 5,000 troops at the end of the year. Currently, we've got about 10,000. I mean, there's, there's some kind of wavering on that. Certainly, the military think we need more troops. But that's hardly any troops at all. Now, it's not the zero we had at the end of 2011 in Iraq. But it's, it's really almost force protection, a little bit of counterterrorism, a little bit of training. And so... My fear is that we're leaving the kind of vacuum we left in Iraq after 2011, and look what happened. We've now got ISIS controlling these places I was embedded with American troops in in, in 2004-05, Fallujah, Ramadi, Mosul, Tikrit, so many American lives um, lost there for a war that we'd, we'd essentially won after the surge. And so, you know, you look at Helmand um, and you look at Afghanistan more generally, I mean, why did we go there in into there in the first place because we had a Taliban um, government that allowed Al Qaeda to launch the 9/11 attacks on America. So what are we doing now? We're allowing the Taliban to step into the into the space that we've left, and already we're seeing these Islamist elements um, taking advantage of that. So why is that? Why are we uh, why are we making these moves uh, to to pull troops out 
when it doesn't seem like it's a good military idea? Well, because, you know, it just gets all political, doesn't it? I mm-hmm. mean, I think President Obama wanted a, a, a bumper sticker for the 2012 election that he'd ended two wars. Mm-hmm. Now, unfortunately, you know, that all sounds very good. And, you know, sure, the American people are, are war weary and they're even more weary when the commander in chief doesn't make the case for why we need need to do difficult things sometimes. I mean, sometimes we need to to um, um, to send the military to places and, and, and certainly there will be loss of life. And it's not an easy decision to make, but sometimes it's a necessary one. But unfortunately, I think, you know, these wars have been started to be run on sort of political timetables in Washington and Brussels and, and, and London rather than um, on you know, on the, on the sort of time of the, the facts on the ground and, 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 and what the military need. And, you know, I mean, what we're seeing now is that we can say a war is over, we can say we ended a war, but the enemy has a vote too. And we've certainly seen that in Iraq, and uh, I fear that we'll see it more and more in Afghanistan as well. You don't think there'll be a change in policy based on uh, the ISIS factor? With regard, well, to, with regard to a withdrawal, I mean? I mean, it's possible, but so far we've had Americans and British beheaded um, on video. And we've had the most despicable acts, sort of crimes against humanity. And we, we haven't done nothing. We're doing airstrikes. We do have um, some um, uh, forces on the ground. But um, it's a very kind of half-hearted, sort of equivocal um, commitment. And um, there's no sign, certainly under this administration, I think, of that changes. Why didn't the Iraqis, and I just want your opinion on this, why did the Iraqis want us out so badly? Uh, did They did not foresee anything like this that's happened in their country since, or, or they just didn't care, or, or what, what do you think the, re- the reason was? Well, I think they wanted their own sovereignty. I think uh, it was a Shia-dominated government. I think the hand of Iran was in there. I think that Iran was very keen to get the Americans out. But I think, I think in some ways, some, some parts of Iraq, they did want a residual force. I mean, certainly a lot of the Iraqi military wanted um, American help, um, but we didn't want to give it because we wanted to be able to say that we did, we just ended the war and Bush's war was over. I want to talk some more uh, in in the moments we have left, and we've got uh, we got uh, about two and a half minutes uh, in, in this segment. But the invisible wounds of the war; these are things that you came up in contact with firsthand in these interviews and whatnot. PTSD. How much of that is out there, and 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 that we're not hearing about? Well, you know, I went out there. Um, you know, I was a little bit of a skeptic about PTSD, sort of wondering what really is it? Is it just sort of people malingering? Is it just excuses? Is it, is it, is it other things? Or is it kind of, you know, parts of society wanting to pity soldiers and see them as victims? But, um, you know, there was a guy called Lance Sergeant Dan Collins, who I got to know very well and was a real hero in, in Helmand. He, he never faltered, never flinched, was shot in the back in his body armor, knocked off his feet. He had another bullet grazed his, his leg. He was twice knocked off his feet by, by IEDs. But, and um, a really impressive guy. And I was in awe of him, you know, when I first interviewed him. thought, you know, you've got the world at your feet. You've, you've proved yourself in combat. You've got this great sort of career ahead of you. But Dan just couldn't live with his demons. He had nightmares about um, his friend, Lance Corporal Dane Elson, um, being blown up very close to him. And he hanged himself on New Year's Day, 2012. It's a shame. And so that, yeah, just absolutely gut wrenching. But that just brought it home to me. This is real. Now, it's not all troops um, that suffer from it. It has different manifestations, but it is treatable. And it doesn't mean that all troops are sort of ticking time bombs who are about to go postal or that they're all damaged individuals. Um, but we can, this is a problem. We can deal with it and we need to deal with it. Tell you what, folks, we do need to take another pause along our network line here. Let us remind everyone that they are listening to the Florida Roundtable. It is a service for Florida's talk and entertainment networks and in the Orlando area on Tough TV 38. Our very special guest this day, Toby Herndon. He is the author of Dead Men Risen, an epic story of war and heroism in Afghanistan. Uh, Toby is the Washington Bureau Chief uh, for the Sunday Times of London. He is a uh, an award-winning author, 
multiple books out there. This particular one from our friends at Regnery History should be available at all the fine bookstores around Florida and places like Amazon.com. I'm Reagan Smith. I'm Al Spry. And we'll continue our conversation following these messages. We're back. You're listening to the Florida Roundtable, a service of Florida's talk and entertainment networks, and in the Orlando area on Tough TV 38. I'm Reagan Smith. I'm Al Spry. Our very special guest this day is Toby Harnden, the author of Dead Men Risen, an epic story of war and heroism in Afghanistan from our friends at Regnery History, available at uh, all the fine bookstores around Florida and Amazon.com. This book uh, is the winner of an Orwell Book Prize. Toby, uh, the the Washington Bureau Chief of the Sunday Times of London, and thank you for spending all this time with us today, Toby. Sure, it's great to be with you. Yeah, I did uh, some uh, volunteer work for about a year with a veteran group. Uh, You find out statistics like one veteran kills themselves every hour, which is, you know, a frightening statistic. And I don't think we're hearing as much about it as we should from the media. I was wondering uh, why that is. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I think like all parts of society, in a way, um, people just move on, you know. Mm -hmm. There's a 24-7 sort of news cycle, you know, Twitter and and, and sort of it's almost ADD in society where people just, you know, something's the flavor of the month on TV and in in the press. And then, then, you know, the next day it's something else. Yeah, but if they would have have spent as much time on PTSD as they did on Harrison Ford's plane, I think we would see, yeah. uh, you know, a lot more, uh, a lot more good things come from that. That that was ridiculous. It's like turning a non-story into a story, but the real stories seem to be left on the cutting room floor. Yeah, right. I know, and I also think that, um, you know, there's a very small segment of society that's been fe- that's been fighting these wars. Now, it's it's great that there's an all vo- volunteer force, um, but what it does mean is. That in you know a lot of a lot of Americans and, and certainly Brits you know, don't really know many servicemen. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, in Flo- Florida is probably an exception. You know, probably there's there's more more veterans and you know more serving military than than most states. But a lot of people in, in the U.S. just you know they're just you know they're just carrying on shopping and all the rest of it while people are fighting and dying for the country out in these places. And so I just think there isn't the sort of the, the buy-in of, of, of society. Yeah, they're, they're, it's not hitting home. In other words, they don't they don't right, see it. You know, right? But but you know, these people have you know, in many cases, um, served you know multiple tours in Iraq and Afghanistan for, for for more than a decade, and this is something that will that will affect them positively and in some cases negatively for the rest of their lives. And and they are part of society. They've they've um, you know given an, an incredible sacrifice, and we need to honor that, and we need to help them. Not least because they've got incredible contributions to make to society as well. I mean, these are amazing people who've done incredible things. Toby, uh, we we hope that folks pick this book up and give it that good read. What do you want people to take away from the reading of your book? Well, I'd like people to take away the reality of, of war. And it's not just about Afghanistan, and it's not just about British troops. And incidentally, there's you know there's a lot about you know U.S. Marines. They were fighting alongside there as well. Um, it's about the sort of the, the universal experience of war and what it what it actually means, not the sort of sanitized headlines and not just the not just the glorification of it um, and, and not also just the sort of, you know, Michael Moore type outlook. I mean, it's much more sort of nuanced than that. And so, I mean, what I wanted to what I wanted to sort of get across in um, in the book is, you know, the heroism, the bravery, the incredible everyday acts that we never hear about. Um, but also, you know, the horrors and the reality. And this is, you know, when we commit troops to um, to fight um, for our country and fight in our name, uh, we need to know what what we're subjecting them to. We we need to know what's going to happen to them, and we need to I mean, we need to give them the the number of troops, and we need to give them the equipment that they need. So those are the things I would like people to take away from the book. What was your uh, scariest moment over there while you were embedded? Well, I think my scariest moment was just walking along um, along these tracks, not knowing whether the next step I might take might be my last. I mean, wow. I had a lot of troops sometimes in front of me with, with, with um, you know, counter ID equipment, but sometimes the ground would gradually impact over a device, and it could be like the ninth person 
in a patrol of 11 soldiers that, that stepped on the device and got blown to pieces. So that was pretty scary. And That's I very scary. Because you don't know when it, was, when it would go off. I mean, you didn't know it was right, right, be, under, be right under your feet. No, I mean, you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't feel a thing. You wouldn't know a thing. And then, you know, the next moment, basically, your comrades would be sort of picking pieces of you out of the trees. I mean, that was the reality out there. I, mean, I experienced it for a relatively short time. But can you imagine doing that? sort of every every day as an infantryman for a nine-month tour. I mean, wow. just incredible. Yeah. Toby, uh, again, thank you for being with us this day. The, the clock does tend to run a little bit fast on us when we get into these things, but uh, certainly have enjoyed this conversation with you. want to remind folks that uh, the book is Dead Men Risen, an epic story of war and heroism in Afghanistan by uh, Toby Harnden. He is the Washington Bureau Chief of the London Sunday Times. It is available, uh, Regnery Publishing, available at all the fine bookstores around Florida and Amazon.com. And, uh, Toby, we hope you come back and do this again when the next one is ready. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it, and I'd like to do that. I'm Reagan Smith. And I'm Al Spry. You are listening to the Florida Roundtable, and we'll be back with a closing thought following these messages. You're listening to the Florida Roundtable, a service of Florida's talk and entertainment networks and in the Orlando area on Tough TV 38. I'm Reagan Smith. I'm Al Spry. And uh, a pleasure to have Toby Harnden with us. Uh, obviously a man who devoted a good chunk of his life to researching this book uh, and to the service of the veterans who served in Iraq and Yeah, a straight shooter and a guy who uh, put himself in harm's way to get the story. Uh, a fascinating book as well. Yeah. Uh, so we were talking a little bit about Hillary uh, emails and yes. uh, Rick Scott. Mm-hmm. I want to finish up on Rick. S- according to uh, the author here, Lucy Morgan, in the 30 years she's watched governors, only Charlie Crist walked into an office with a plan for keeping the records of his administration public. He created an open government office named Pat Gleason as special counsel, and he directed state agencies to comply. However, this all changed when Scott was elected. He does not make most of his travel public. He never discloses who travels with him on his personal Mm. airplane. On any given day, most of us don't know where Scott is. This is how he was able to join sugar lobbyists in a secret trip to the King Ranch in Texas. It was only discovered later when the Tampa Bay Times gained access to Texas hunting license records. Mm -hmm. Of course, Scott and his staff rarely even answer questions posed by reporters. Instead, they repeat talking points released earlier. Uh, So not a very good uh, report card for uh, Scott. I wanted to I want to uh, mention just briefly I was recently uh, in uh, South Carolina and guess I, I didn't see a whole lot of news but one of the local newscasts that I did see guess whose face popped up at a press conference and meeting and talks in South Carolina Lou Fry No this <laughs> fellow named Jeb Bush Oh Jeb Jeb was there and and uh, uh, um, the governor of Wisconsin uh, Scott Walker and, of course, the talking there, uh, South Carolina will be the first southern state to hold a presidential primary in 2016. And so they may not be spending a lot of time, but they're already in there in South Carolina talking to people, kissing a couple of babies, uh, and, and trying to get the points and some feeling for what is going on there. Well, speaking of which, Scott Walker poked fun at Jeb Bush at a gridiron dinner uh, in Washington. Uh, here's one. He says, Jeb Bush isn't here. Although I see his campaign Brinks truck is parked outside. (laughs) Hillary Clinton is in here tonight. When I asked why, I was told you couldn't afford her. And here's another one. When Jeb Bush was in Florida, he had to deal with a left-wing dictator just 90 miles from his border. Look at the map I can relate. I have the same thing with Rahm Emanuel. So, <laughs> that's pretty good. It's pretty good. Well, at least we know that Scott Walker has got a reasonable sense of humor. And uh, <laughs> we can't leave off without mentioning Rubio. He's in Washington this week for Senate work, including a Tuesday morning hearing on Venezuela. He's chair of the Foreign Relations Committee Subcommittee on Western Hemisphere. He previously held a hearing on the Obama administration's overtures to Cuba. So he's uh, he's making his moves as well. Uh, and uh, we shall see where all of this goes from here. There you go. Well, we hope that you have enjoyed the uh, conversation half as much as Alan and I enjoy putting this thing together for you each week. Well, I'm tickled pink. And uh, 
Uh, well, that's wonderful, and especially <laughs> in the Florida sunshine. You know, you work on that tan. But uh, we do thank you for your time, and, and we hope that you'll drop us a note uh, if you are so inclined. The Florida Roundtable, of course, a service of Florida's talk and entertainment networks and in the Orlando area on Tough TV 38. I'm Reagan Smith. I'm Al Spry. We'll see you again next week on the Florida Roundtable. <laughs> You've been listening to Florida Roundtable, a weekly look at issues and problems of concern to Floridians from a state, national, and international perspective. Presented by the Florida News Network with your hosts, Reagan Smith and Al Spry. The views and opinions expressed during the preceding program are solely those of the participants and not necessarily those of this station's ownership, management, or sponsors of FNN. Your views and opinions are welcome. Address your card or letter to Florida Roundtable in care of Reagan Smith. 2500 Maitland Center Parkway, Suite 407, Maitland, Florida, 32751. Or you may email reagansmith at fnnonline.com. Thank you for listening, and please join us again next week for another edition of Florida Roundtable.